Tonight, it's a pleasure to welcome back an old friend and colleague, Dr. William Cooper, who is going to discuss California's water supply and the legal and environmental impact uh, issues impacting it. Actually, the official title, Earth, Wind, Fire, and Water. I spent most of my life in the Midwest and on the East Coast, and people ask me often whether I miss the seasons. And I say, no, we have seasons out here, drought, earthquakes, fire, and mudslides. Um, so we do have our seasons. Bill was the, served as the, uh, <clears throat> re until very recently when he retired, he was the professor of civil and environmental engineering and director of the Urban Water Research Center at the University of California, Irvine. He served previously as the professor of chemistry and director of the Drinking Water Research Center at Florida International University and as chair and professor of chemistry at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. <clears throat> and he just completed a stint recently uh, as a program director at the National Science Foundation. In 2011, he was elected as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in 2014, he was elected a fellow of the Association of Environmental Engineers and Science Profession Professors. He published a, a book of his butterfly photography, The Butterflies of Iguaza Falls, Argentina, and he's had a number of photographic exhibitions, most recently one at the National Science Foundation in Arlington, Virginia. He's in the process of making his butterfly photos and videos from Argentina into a documentary. He's a member of the Entomological Society of Washington and the Maryland Entomological Society. So he's a kind of, but we call him Bugsy. Uh, Bill, Bill is, is very important to us because he's helping us develop the story for our expansion. It's going to focus on the intersection between food, energy, and water. And Bill has been very helpful to us in that. Please join me in welcoming back Dr. William Cooper. When, when Linda asked me, what should your title of your talk be, I just blurted out, well, why don't we just do it? Uh, what did I say is the title? Water, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Water. Well, we're going to really focus on water, but certainly California is, is uh, involved in all of those this year. When I was a freshman in high school, that's a long time ago, I took a course, and the only thing I think I remember from high school was the fact that, that I learned that the four basic necessities of life, in fact, we only had three back there because then air wasn't involved, were food, water, air, and shelter. So obviously, water, something that we're going to be talking about tonight, and I think um, I can't emphasize the complexity of water in California, no less the complexity of water in the United States. I have actually spent about three and a half days writing this lecture, uh, mostly just trying to organize it so it would be reasonably understandable for, for, for me and for you as well. So one thing that we've learned recently is that we're now looking at wicked problems. And wicked problems are those problems that basically there's some uh, real definitions here. But basically a wicked problem is one that involves many iterations, many different disciplines, and many different potential solutions, and sometimes no solutions at all, so we have to minimize our losses. But a wicked problem is something that we've talked about, and there are, I've got, oh, by the way, and, and the, the aquarium has this whole presentation, so if you need to get it, you're more than welcome to have it. Um, it was originally, this whole idea of a wicked problem was uh, most recently uh, enumerated by this guy Churchman in a guest editorial in management science. So it's, it's, it's an area that we've talked about, certainly at the National Science Foundation, because many of the problems that we as a society are facing are, in fact, wicked problems. And the water in California is clearly a wicked problem. To try to keep you on track here, and me on track as well, this is the outline of the talk. The first thing I wanted to mention is that when we talk about water, population is the biggest enemy of water. Overpopulation um, is clearly a problem uh, with water and just about everything else on land. Uh, and climate change is the biggest unknown. So if we 
if all of this is in the context that population is the biggest enemy and climate change is the biggest unknown, that helps to frame the context in which this talk is given. What I want to do is I want to start out by talking about the California water stage. Uh, we're going to set the stage for the talk. And then we're going to talk about the value of water, drought, Southern California economy and water, which will, is, a, is a mind blower, agriculture in California and how it could potentially impact water in Southern California, the concept of water footprint, climate variability, and then if we have some time, water reuse and desal. Jerry said, I have to stick to 45 minutes, which if you know as a professor, that's impossible. Um, but we'll try. When he starts jumping up and down, then I know that I'm getting close to the end of my time. So we'll start with the California um, water stage. The gross domestic product of California is $2.4 trillion in 2015. That makes California the sixth largest economy in the world. We're sixth after the United States, China, Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom. That in and of itself is something that should be paused if you didn't know that statistic. That should make you think about the fact that California, not only is it a long state, and I didn't really realize how long it is until I realized that the shoreline is about 1,100 miles, and that's the equivalent on the East Coast of going from Orlando, Florida to Washington, D.C. And I've traveled that distance a number of times. That's a long way. So we have a big state. It's a rich state. And in fact, it is the sixth largest economy in the world. California population, when we say that population is the biggest enemy of water, um, oops, I messed up my things here. But you can see um, that in 2010, the last census, we were at 37 million. 2016, they estimated 39. Um, this actually is wrong because I've moved out of California, so it's really only 39 million 589, 143. So I'm now going to Florida uh, to live. So that's the estimates off by one. Um, it could be more or less, but you never know. The point is, is that the population of California is, is nearly 40 uh, million, um, and that's that's a significant increase uh, in California. And I just. You just need to kind of keep that, mo that number in mind. Um, because if you look at Southern California, there are 10 counties that are normally uh, used to define Southern California. The top five counties in the state are all in Southern California. 10 million, 3 million, 3 million, 2 million, 2 million. And then with Kern, Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and Imperial, we're up to a total of 23 million people in Southern California, which is about 60% of the population of California. Oops, I think I just maybe missed one. OK. So California water, that's what we're really talking about. The years of 2012 to 2016, water years, which starts October 1st, by the way, um, were among the driest and the warmest on record. 2017 was the wettest year on record for much of California. And the interesting thing is here, thousands of water managers were struggling to store as much water as they could because they knew that this thing is going to change very rapidly. Jay Lund is a friend of mine from UC Davis, and he wrote this in the water blog um, just December 31st in 2017. I have included some, some where I could, some uh, reference to the actual uh, the data that, that I've stolen from, from, in this case, Jay. The 218 water forecast, in fact, I just had a really brief discussion with Kevin Wadier, who used to be the general manager of the Long Beach Water District, and he said this is really scary. I mean, Northern California right now is 67% of the average rainfall for this time of year. So it's down a third. Further south in the San Joaquin Basin, the precipitation is about 38%, or they're down 40, 60%. If you go to the Tulare Basin, and I've got a picture of where that is, is only 25% of the average, which doesn't bode well for the year of 2018 as being a water-rich year. The, snow, the scariest thing is that our largest single reservoir of water in the state of California is the snowpack in the Sierras. And right now, that stands at 27%. In fact, um, 
Kevin said it's actually down closer to 25% of the average snowpack for this time of the year. The reason that's important if you're a water person is because that's our largest reservoir of water in the state of California. And it's only a quarter of what it has, of, of the average from, for a series of years. So it looks like 2018 is, on, is, is going to be a record low year as far as precipitation goes. And snowpack being our, is, is going to, well, I could show you a picture in a minute, is, is really, really difficult because that's what the snowpack, if you combine the, just the fact that we're not getting the precipitation and that when we do get the precipitation as a result of climate change and climate warming, a lot of it does not come down as snow. It comes down as rain, and we can't collect that like we could collect snow in the snowpack in the Sierras. So I couldn't figure out where the Tulare um, res area is. There's actually used to be, uh, in years gone by, that's several hundred years, there was actually a big lake, which was known as Tulare Lake down there. Uh, it's since been drained and, and converted into uh, agricultural land. Okay. One of the concepts that when we're talking about climate change and a lot of other the changes that are going on in the world are known as nonlinear responses to changes. The most famous of all the nonlinear changes, and I put this up just as a point of reference, um, was the collapse of the Atlantic cod stocks in the eastern coast of, the, of, the, of uh, Newfoundland there. And you can see that for years, so this is 1850, that's a pretty blurry 1850. You can see that for years, the amount of cod that was collected was in the 200,000 fish landings in tons, okay? So 200,000 tons of fish. And then of course, back in the 60s, we actually improved our ability to harvest these cod. So the, 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 the amount of cod that was harvested went up to the high of 800,000. But then look at what happened was a precipitous drop there, a little bit of a rebound. Then in 1992, the cod fisheries crashed so far that it has not yet can, uh, actually recovered from that. And these are called nonlinear responses. And, and I think that's what we're really, as far as climate change is concerned, these are the kinds of things we're looking at nationwide and worldwide. The kinds of things with the increased population, our increased technology, is that we're going to see these things happening. I don't know if any of you have seen Ted Danson's uh, narrated End of the Line. And in that movie, it was talking about bluefin tuna. Uh, they're, they're suggesting that the rate we're harvesting bluefin tuna by the late um, 2040s and 2050, there will be no more blue tuna, bluefin tuna harvested because we will, have, we will have harvested them all out of the ocean. These are the kinds of things that are, were unexpected, and I think we as a population can expect these kinds of things, these nonlinear responses, more and more and more as the population grows, in particular as we see and uh, believe in climate change and see the climate variability. We're going to see a lot of these fish stocks and other things crashing down to beyond reproduce a, a point at which they can reproduce. Now, eventually the cod will come back because there's no longer a cod fisheries. But you can see this was in 92 and we're here in 2018. So that's had almost, uh, what's that, 20 years almost 30 years of, of ability to, to recover, and it hasn't recovered yet. So these kinds of nonlinear responses are going to be something that we are not going to foresee. I mean, there's going to be a few of us that will foresee them. Um, but there are things that are going to have really, really adverse impacts on the environment and on our ability to be sustainable. OK, so that's kind of the California water stage. Now, let's talk about the value of water. Most of us take water for granted. We turn on the tap, the water comes out. Um, and we know that water is, in fact, one of the four necessities of life. When I was in the Army back in the 70s, um, we actually, it was it's, uh, two liters per person per day is what you need. And, and they figured out if you were in the Army and you didn't get water for five days, you were dead. So this is not just something that we're thinking about. This is real. Water is one of the four necessities of life. So in fact, we take water for granted. Once that, it, um, once that was not bad when we had 200 million people here, but now that was in 1965. But now in 2017, 
we're looking at an estimate of 326, 100, 326 million people in the United States. There's a big difference between a population of 200 and 326 in the United States with respect to water and how we think of water. It's economics, of course. So what I did one time is I was actually giving a lecture in Salt Lake City to a bunch of non-water people. So I was trying to figure out how could you figure out the importance of water. So what I did is I went down to my local store and actually bought 50 pounds of sand and put it in a glass of water here. Um, and it cost, I figured out the economics, it was about uh, nine cents per glass of sand. Now, if you've ever tried to drink sand, it's not particularly appealing. Uh, it's pretty tough on your intestines. Beach rock is even, or, or clean gravel is even worse. And that's 14 cents a glass. Beach rock, which I had a little bit in my old house down in, um, uh, down in Southern Cal, down in Lisa Viejo, was 37 cents a, a, a glass. But try drinking that stuff. It's not really very appetizing. This is how we pay for water, 0. 0.00023 dollars for a glass of water. And yet, it's, a, it's essential to life. Now, you can say, well, but water, you know, this, it's, there's a lot of it around. Well, there isn't that much when there's uh, 356 or 65 million people. We have to think about this whole thing. And if we were to value water to, for what, it was, what it's really worth, I think we would start to understand that we need to start to respect our water and our water resources. Uh, desalination is a whole other issue. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a bit. Well, I think we will. Uh, so we, I could spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's easy to see from this figure here where you're probably not going to be going out drinking a glass of, of sand tonight. You might drink a glass of water, and you realize that even sand, as we purchase it here in Southern California, is what? It's about three or four times uh, more expensive than the water that we drink. And yet water, whoops, what'd they do? There we go. But water is essential and sand is not as far as human health is concerned. Okay, now let's talk about drought. I think the biggest question in my mind is why do we continue to call this a drought? Because what does, in your minds, what does a drought kind of conjure up? That there's going to be an end to it, right? And I don't think that in the western U.S., southwestern U.S. in particular, that we're going to be out of a drought for several hundred years at the rate we're going. So I think we need to start thinking about, um, is it really a drought or is it the new norm? And I'll show you some data from Lake Mead that I think will actually, if you haven't seen it, will we'll, um, show you that I think maybe we need to start thinking about uh, renaming this drought or just saying, hey, this is the new norm. Historically, the largest reservoir in water, I've already talked about this, is the snowpack in the Sierras. It's down to 27% of the average snowpack. That means that there's not going to be as much water in the north and as much water in the east where we import all of our water. And we'll get to that in a second. This is California today. The hot winter means that snowpack is far below norm. In fact, it's a quarter of what it normally is. This was reported in the New York Times. Um, by Matt Stevens and Julie Turkowitz, just February 2nd of 2018. So this is not old news. And this is the snowpack that you're seeing in the Sierras. Again, why is snowpack so important? First of all, snowpack sits around when it's colder. It sits around and then melts slowly over the course of the summer, giving us and providing us with a source of water for the Central Valley and other portions of, of California uh, slowly and, and we can then, so this becomes a huge reservoir. The problem is now that with temperatures increasing and even we're getting less precipitation to start with, and then second of all, that precipitation is coming down as rain and not as snow. We don't have the capacity, although last year you saw almost all the reservoirs are, are overflowing. In fact, one just about burst north of Sacramento there. We don't have the ability to store that rain as it's coming off the, the mountains, unlike Mother Nature's old way of our refrigerator being up there on the Sierra. So if we look at today, 
Uh, California counties, right now, there's three California counties. Well, this actually was as of February 1. Three California counties in severe drought already. And you remember, California's drought state of emergency was actually lifted less than a year ago. And already we're talking about three California counties already being in a severe drought situation. The weekly report released Thursday, January 31st, which is not that long ago, by the U.S. Drought Monitor, and you can find this on, your, uh, on, your, on the web. If you just look up, Google just U.S. Drought Monitor, and they'll show you what's going on. Shows that 44% of the state of California is now considered to be in a moderate drought. So that's as of January 31st. It's, it's a, a dramatic jump from just a week before when the figure was only 13%. So that means that within a week, the estimates went from 13% of California being in a drought to 44% of California being in a moderate drought. Again, I would argue, and, and this is more of a political problem than it is a reality problem, is that we have people saying, oh, the drought's over, so then people forget that they're supposed to actually conserve water. This is a real problem. Southern California is going to face some real difficult problems in the future as, as far as water and water supply go. And this year is not going to help it at all. So now I want to change a little bit. So we've talked about the value of water. We've all agreed, haven't we, that we undervalue water. We've all agreed that, as in fact, we're going to have a drought. And that drought's probably going to be 150 to 200 years long. The question is, what about the California economy and water? And this is really interesting. The eco economic engine of Southern California, this is bringing it home, is about $880 billion a year. That's from Santa Barbara down to Tijuana, OK? To fuel that engine, we import 60% of the water that we need down here in Southern California, 50% from the Bay Delta region and 50% from the Colorado River, OK? So we get water. The reason we're that we're actually surviving down here is because we're taking 50% of that 60% um, from the Delta Bay area, the San Francisco Bay Delta region, and 50% from the Colorado River. And what are the problems with that? Well, if we look at the Bay Delta region, the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta is a great natural treasure, and it's a vital link in the state's water system. This is what really blew my mind. The delta consists of approximately 57 reclaimed islands and tracks surrounded by 1,100 miles of levees. Those levees, for the most part, are built out of sand and peat. And they were started back in the eight, late 1800s and have continued to grow. And inside some of those levees, the, the land has actually subsided 40 feet. So actually, there's... There's water in these levees. It's way above the water level uh, within inside that. And it's bordered by 700 miles of waterways. So this, this whole delta area that supplies 50% of our water, well, 30% of our water down here, is, is really at the brink of any day just becoming totally unreliable. What if they have a huge earthquake up there? It's not even when. Some people would say um, it's not if. It's when they have a big earthquake. The Delta smelt, of course, most of you have heard of the fact that, that we have this endangered species up there that's, that's driving one of, the, one of the problems with this conveyance of water from the region uh, to Southern California. Um, when we start to take water out of this Delta Bay area, we pump it up over the, uh, the mountains and send it down here. And if we start to ingest Delta smelt, then they shut those, that water down. The solution to this conveyance issue, is, which is being discussed and maybe even passed right now, are underground tunnels. They're talking about tunneling under the delta so that you take the water out of the Sacramento River, you skip the entire delta area, and to the tune of 15 or $16 billion, they're going to build two uh, deep tunnels that are going to be um, just water conveyance tunnels for the water to skip the, the, del the Bay Area, or the delta area, and then deliver it down to us. It's still going to have to go up over the, the I can't ever pronounce those mountains. Hit, hit, yeah, what are they? The Hatchabees. I forget the tuh. 
the Hatchabees. There we go. So another issue is getting back to the snowpack. Here we're already taking 30% of the water that we need in Southern California from Northern California. The snowpack, the biggest uh, reservoir in the entire state, is, is now at 20%, 27% of its normal size. And a lot of that uh, precipitation now, instead of coming down as snow, comes down as rain. So I think you're starting, well, and then of course we have to talk about the energy costs of, of conveyance of that water from the north to the south or from the east to Colorado to the south. The east, the east is actually even maybe a slight bit more subtle. The two major reservoirs on the Colorado River um, are Lake Mead and Lake Powell. Lake Mead is the biggest in water volume. Lake Powell is bigger in surface area. But you've got the upper uh, Colorado, which then they have this huge Lake Powell there, and then the lower Colorado where they have Lake Mead. And I'm going to show you a picture in just a second about the water levels in Lake Mead. But the major problem is one that people don't, I don't think the, the public, I don't think probably anybody really realizes this. Well, the major problem is that Colorado is already overallocated by 10%. That means that in the process of allocating water from the Colorado River to the six or seven states that are involved, they've actually, they did it when there was a very high flow. And now that the flows are down, it means that if everybody that is due a certain amount of water from the Colorado was to take it, we would run out of water in the Colorado. It's overallocated. But the biggest problem is it's salty. It's not real salty, but it's salty enough that um, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California imports 1.2 cubic kilometers of this water yearly. So a cubic kilometer is a kilometer by a kilometer by a kilometer, 1.2 cubic kilometers. So I did some quick calculations, it wasn't quite so quick, um, and realized that we in Southern California, as a result of importing this much water from the Colorado River, import 900,000 tons of salt in that water to feed irrigation in a desert. What happens in desert? Water evaporates. Salt doesn't evaporate. What it does, it ends up poisoning the soil. This problem, I don't know that many water purveyors are talking about this problem of salt in the desert. This is a huge gorilla in the closet, I can tell you that. Because once you've poisoned this soil with salt, the only way to get rid of it is to have, that's when you're going to start praying for atmospheric rivers to come over and dump a whole bunch of fresh water on there and flush that salt out of there. This is a huge number. And, um, and it's only going to get worse because uh, the, the, the concentration of the salts are probably going to go up more and more as both water from Lake Powell and Lake Mead evaporate. The salt stays in there. It becomes saltier. So... It's, it's likely that the amount of salt that's imported into, the, into Southern California is going to go up, not go down. But this is, this is really something that we have to start thinking about. There's many, many places in the United States where already we've poisoned the soil because of this salt that's in the water. So that's, a, that's I don't know how many people have heard about that or even thought about that in the audience, but that's something you want to just keep thinking about, the fact that we're importing 50% of the water that we need, 30% of the water that we need, from this highly saline, color, well, it's not highly saline, it's, it's 650 milligrams per liter of salt. Um, but you wouldn't even want to drink the Colorado without getting rid of some of that salt. It's actually beyond drinking water treatment uh, quality uh, numbers. So this poisoning of the soil, I think, is, a, is a, another one of these issues. Now, I don't know if you can see this. I'm hoping you can, but I'll try to help you out here. This is, this is the water level in Lake Mead since it was built in 1935. You can see when they first closed the dam, it started to go up, and it went up. And it's been bouncing around here at 1,180 feet above sea level. That's how they, that's how they look at it. And you can see that here, here it was already up to, well, I, don't know what, I don't know what that is over there, but anyway, you can see it was up. But about 1999, 98, 99, 2000, 
The level of the water in Lake Mead has been going down. This was that atmospheric river that hit us in 2010. I don't know if you remember that. There was about 10 inches of rain down here. And then in the, in the Sierras, they got a lot of rain. And up into the Rockies, they got a lot of rain. And you can see that the reservoir actually got recharged. But now, with this last year having been the wettest year um, in a long, well, I think in history, as long as they've been keeping them, it was 2015, 16, 17 right here. You see, the amount that we got recharged into Lake Mead was actually pretty small. 2018 is, is looking like it's going to be worse than anything we've seen. So I think that, that you could start to realize that maybe um, climate change and the, the global climate models, which are suggesting that we're going to get drier, not wetter here, we're starting to see that effect in a reasonably linear. You can see it. You could say, well, it looks like it's, it's leveling off here. But I think it's, it's, you know, it's going to be going down like this. And you can see there's different conditions that have been set. So this is only about water. The other problem is not only are we going to be losing our sources of water, we get 30% of our electricity from, the, from the, the dam up there, the Hoover Dam. So we're not only going to be losing water, we're going to be losing a cheap source of a lot of the energy that we get here in Southern California. I think, in my mind, this is the best data that would say, yes, we're not in a drought. This is the new norm. We've basically been in a drought since 1998 to 99 to 2000. And that's the level of Lake Mead. Somebody said the other day, well, maybe that's because we're storing it all up in, up in Lake Powell. But that's not the case. I was checking that out. Here, I've got a little data on Lake Powell, too. But this is really interesting. And this should be pause for concern for everybody in Southern California. Remember, we're getting 30% of all the water we use in Southern California from the Colorado. And if this is the major reservoir on the lower Colorado, which is what is of interest to us, you can see that the, the, the sea level is going down. If you ever go out to, to Lake Mead, it's really cool. It's got the biggest case of ring around the collar that you've ever seen. Um, and that ring around the collar is now getting to be about 100 plus feet uh, in depth. So um, it's really an interesting, interesting experience to go out there. So this is, so it's, unfortunately, I don't have the same kind of data uh, for, for Lake Powell as I do for Lake Mead. But you can see here, um, these are the da daily elevations. So at Lake Powell, if it's full, is at 3,700 feet, OK, above sea level, OK, not, not depth. But you can see this is 3,630. So this is already 70 feet under full. And in 2014, this was what the water level looked like. It came back up in the spring. Um, so this is October, December, January, March, April, May, June. This is where you've got the snow melt from not only the Sierras, but the Rockies as well. Okay, So you can see that snow melt there is, is, drives up the, the, uh, the value. This was, uh, so you can see the orange here is 2015, so we had a little bit more water there. The green is 2016, the red is 17. And right now, you can see that as a result of this relatively wet winter that we had a year ago in 2017 and 2016, in the Rockies, you can see that the upper part of the Colorado is being recharged a lot. That is, the, the amount of water that's being stored in the Lake Powell is considerably above these three or four years, which were the driest years um, that we've recorded in recent history. So there is reason, a little bit of reason to think that maybe this is going to help us as far as releasing more water from Powell to get into Lake Mead. But ultimately, these are only, only small variations in what I think is, in fact, a decreasing of quantity of water in Lake Mead. And again, that's important because we get 30% of our water from the Colorado. OK, so the economy is huge down here. But yet, in order to feed that $880 billion engine, we have to import 60% of our water. 
Now, agriculture. People really pick on agriculture a lot, as I did, until I started looking into the, into the statistics. Um, so the only good news in agriculture is our production of tobacco is zero dollars. That, I think, is great. We're 50th out of 50 states. I don't know how many actually produce tobacco, but I know we're way at the bottom. That's the good news. California ranked as the leading agricultural state in the United States. And so our Cal the farm sales totaled $42 billion um, in 2012. California's top 10 valued commodities for 2016 were milk and cream, $6 billion worth of milk we produce, grapes, 5.58. This does not include wine. Wine's a whole other area that they didn't actually uh, include, but I've got some data on that. Almonds, 5 billion. Cattle and calves, 2.53 billion. Lettuce, 1.96 billion. So as far as milk and cream, we're seventh out of 50 states. Almonds were first. Lettuce were first. Grapes were, were first. Cattle and calves were seventh. Strawberries were first. Pistachios, 1.5 billion, were first out of 50. Tomatoes were first out of 50. Walnuts were uh, first out of 50. And broilers, I presume that's chickens, um, it were seventh out of 50. Hay and alfalfa. So we had, had some discussions today. Hay and alfalfa generates $966 million in, in the state of California. So we were talking today at, at our meeting about the Pacific Vision, the, the new expansion that you've seen out there, uh, about the fact that, well, what we should do is we should just outlaw hay and alfalfa. That's, that's darn close to a billion dollars worth of hay and alfalfa that we make. But we could convert that into maybe crops uh, that we could use to eat instead of uh, export, because a lot of that gets exported. But I, was, I had to put this in here for tobacco, because I've been a smoker since I was three years old um, and uh, hate tobacco. And it should be outlawed totally. But I'm happy to say that we're 50 out of 50 a state in tobacco. These numbers are, in my mind, these numbers are staggering. Um, to think that we produce this much milk and cream and this much cattle. And this will come back when I talk about water from California is not only a California issue, it's a national issue. And I'll, you'll see what I mean in a couple of minutes. So just kind of, for all the students in here, I want you to memorize all these, because I'll be asking you questions about how, what, what, the, what the, the quantities here are in, in billions. OK. So as far as California wines, um, California accounts for approximately 90% of the wine production in the United States. California wines in the US market have increased from 191 million cases shipped in 2006 to 238 million cases in 2016. Um, if you ever want to have a really interesting visit, go up to San Francisco. There's the Wine Institute there. And they've got a lot of facts and figures at the Wine Institute in San Francisco. I used to be part of the environmental dialogue in California. And we would have our meetings there sometimes. And it was always fascinating. I hardly ever could get through a meeting without looking at all the wine there, because I love red wine. Um, but this is interesting. California wine sales in the US hit new records, 238 million cases, with a retail value of $34 billion. Now, this is something that, that the USDA didn't take into, into consideration. All they were looking at was, was grapes. And even at that, we're, we're number one in the United States, with the grapes valued at $5.58 billion. That does not include the grapes that, or the, the cost of wine. Um, or how those grapes, those grapes get used for wine, but also for raisins. And you can see that if you look at the, the oh shoot, um, you can see that, that, that we've got a lot of wine business here. In fact, I thought that number was 40 billion. That's the one I've always quoted. But uh, I looked it up. Um, I, oh, I looked it up at this website. Here you go. That's the Wine Institute. The reason I put these in here is for the students, because I expect the students all to remember these things and go back and check my facts. You know, we need to, when you, when you have a politician like me, um, you have to always check the facts, right? So I'm trying to be up around 95 to 98%, unlike some people we know and love. 
The state shipped an all-time high of 230 million cases to the U.S. in 2016. Now, if we look at the water that we exported from that, 109 liters of water goes, on average, to produce a 125 mil glass of wine. So if you got four or five glasses of wine in one bottle, let's say four, because that's easy, that's 400 liters of water that goes into one glass of wine. And we're shipping out 238 million cases of wine. The interesting thing is, is these, we ship a lot out to California, but we also ship an awful lot of wine to other countries. So it's the European Union, and we know the French love wine. So, and now that the Brits are out of the European Union, this number's going to go down a little bit, but not much. That's supposed to be a joke. Um, so the European Union accounts for $685 million worth of U.S. wine. Canada, Hong Kong, Japan, China, Mexico, South Korea, um, Switzerland, and Singapore, and the Philippines all actually consume a considerable amount of our wine, and therefore they also consume a considerable amount of our water that goes to growing this wine. OK, so now we want to talk about water footprint. I've kind of alluded to it, but we're going to talk about it right now if I can hit the right button. There we go. The water footprint is the calculated amount of water necessary to produce various products in agriculture, or in fact, any other product. Blue jeans, for example, there's a water footprint for, for blue jeans. I've, I've seen that, and I don't remember what it is, but it's pretty high. Virtual water is used to evaluate the amount of water used in growing a crop or farm animal in our agricultural case. Data on the following slide was obtained originally from these two publications. Um, Hextra here out of the Netherlands was the first one to actually quantify the concept of water footprint. And that is the, the amount of water that you need to produce vegetables or beef or whatever um, and I think if we get lucky, and I think we've, we've coordinated it between the guys who really know what they're doing up in the back and me, they'll show you a little, one of these calculators. But look at this. Almonds, to get a kilogram, and I'm sorry that I had to leave these in kilograms. Kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. Requires 16,000 liters of water. Beef, enjoy your steak because it took 15,000 um, liters or 15,000 kilograms of water to produce one kilogram of, of beef. Chocolate, um, we had chocolate cake. Look at that, 17,000 liters per kilogram of chocolate. That's why I don't eat chocolate. Cotton, again, 9,000 liters. Lettuce, so lettuce is good as long as you make sure that it's clean and you don't have that E. coli 057 on it and, and get the, the, the runs from it. Um, but lettuce has got a very low water footprint. Milk has got a reasonably low water footprint. But still, for every one kilogram of milk, um, you're, you're using 1,000 kilograms of water. Tomatoes, 214. Tomatoes dried, 4,275. 4, vanilla beans, look at this, 126,000. And who doesn't like vanilla beans, right? Luckily, we don't grow a lot of them in, in, in California. That's a phenomenal amount of water to get. Uh, that's, 126,000 um, liters of water, a liters, liter is a kilogram. And wheat bread is about 1,600. So the point is, is that we can, now this is where we're going to actually see some footprints. So look at this. What, what you do when you go to that, and I hope, I hope all the students memorize that, that, that site. Um, then if you didn't, the, the, you can get it off of, off of uh, the, the aquarium website here. So for every... Here, in, so for every kilogram of peaches, we use 910 liters of, of, of water. Can we go, can we advance that to the pizza? Whoops, oh, that's all right, you can stick it, you can, there you go. It's not trivial, I guarantee you. That's exactly the way I did. So to get a good margarita pizza, you're gonna, it costs you 1,259 liters per pizza. Now, we didn't decide how big that is, but it's, let's go to the pig. This will really gross you out. So for every kilogram of pig meat you get, and I have to tell you, I lived in eastern Carolina, and we used to have pig picking parties that were unbelievable. We would start 
roasting that pig at 7 in the morning, and by 5 it was ready to eat. We used kind of a vinegar-based barbecue sauce, and it was, it was finger-picking good. But for every kilogram of that pig, it cost us 6,000 liters of water. So let's go on, just keep spinning a little while, and let's just see where the dial... Oh, whoo sheep meat. Look at that. 10,000 liters per kilogram of sheep. All right? This is a really, really cool website. And there's things, I'm not even going to go into these... But, but they even break it down into the fact that it's the kind of waters, green, blue, and gray. Uh, I was going to go into that, but we just don't have time. But it's very simple to, to, uh, to, to find this. On the web, uh, I think I just put um, water footprint calculator or something like that. Let's just go for a couple more. Just spin the dial there. Ah, tomato, tomato, tomato. Woo -hoo. See there? 214. So tomatoes are good. And lycopene is great for you. So you should go out and eat, buy tomatoes and drink, eat them raw. You get lycopene, which is good for your heart, and antioxidants and stuff like this. The mix is 50% green, 30% blue, and 20% gray. I'm not going to go into those because I've forgotten what they are. Um, but, oh, here's my favorite. How about a glass of wine? 109 liters. I think I already showed it. 109 liters. Um, for is, is uh, what, what am I doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For one glass of wine, about 125 mils. I usually only eat 123, um, just to save a little bit. So it's 100 liters of water. The point is, the fun thing about this calculator is, is that you can figure out what your food water footprint is, and you can make choices with what you're eating I think what, I'm, what you're seeing, though, is that water in Southern California is really complicated. This is an unbelievable statement. And it was done by the New York Times. I can't say as I've calculated exactly, but I now understand what they get. The average American in the United States, outside of California, consumes more than 300 gallons of California water each week because of the food that they eat. And the way you do that, and I, I, I thought that's nonsense, until you go back to the agricultural things and you see that we're number one in milk and milk and whatever it was. And we're, you know, so often we're number one. And so it's with this water footprint, and this is exactly what they did. They went to the US Department of Agricultural's data, which I put up there, and it's this virtual water. So in fact, the water issues of California are really a national issue. We cannot leave our agricultural system in the lurch because the rest of the country is going to suffer from the fact that we're number one in vegetables, number one in, in things like nuts and fruits and stuff like that. So we've already talked about climate variability. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that. I'd love to talk about water reuse. I've been studying that since in the 70s when I ran the Army's water reuse program. Water reuse is one of the ways of getting new water. If you go down to the Orange County Water District in uh, Fountain Valley, and if you get a chance, they have tours there every week, or you can arrange for a tour down there. They're, they are actually producing 100 million gallons of, a day of, of drinkable water. The, the public health people are a little bit behind the time, so they don't let you drink it. You can drink it if you go on campus there, because I have, and it's, it's actually great water. It's so pure that in order to get it back up to Anaheim to re-inject it into the groundwater, you actually have to add calcium carbonate or the, it will dissolve the, the pipes that, are, that move it up there. So it's really, really pure water. Now, uh, so I'm not going to go into that, but we do need to talk just a tad bit about desal. So this is the Irvine Ranch water district. If you ever hear people talk about purple pipe, it really is purple. And it's purple because what it is, it's treated to potable quality. That's drinking water standards, but you're not allowed to drink it. Although the kids at UCI, the reason we've got such a healthy population is we fertilize the entire campus with purple pipe. And, and when they're playing Frisbee, they're, they're playing in, in, in water that, this, that meets potable requirements. Uh, and they're drinking it, and they get their nitrogen and phosphorus out of it. It's really great. Okay. 
This is another fact we need to just kind of, in the Southern California, we discharge one billion gallons of water a day into the ocean. If we could treat that water to the efficiency that uh, Orange County does, that's 80% efficiency, we would be able to save 800 million gallons of water a day, which would reduce significantly our requirement to bring water down from the north or in from the east. It's coming, it's slow. Um, I funded the first uh, international water reuse conference in 1979 when I was in the Army. I funded it with the National Science Foundation and the Department of the Interior. And the, the discussions they're having today are no different than they were in 1979, except we've got a lot more science behind us now that says that direct potable reuse is probably something we, have, we should strive for. Desal, I'm not going to get into it. Um, for desalination, um, you probably all know about the, the one down uh, south of, of the, the uh, Navy, the uh, Marine base down there. Desal, if you're a manager, a water manager you sh in the coastal environment, you should be thinking about desal. But it is two to three times more expensive than taking your sewage and treating it to a drinking water. So there's a lot of economic reasons to go toilet to tap. Okay, um, And from a safety point of view, this water is much safer for you uh, to drink than the groundwater that, that we dump it back into. And it's a lot cheaper than desal uh, as well. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end. As you can imagine, um, I actually did spend three and a half days trying to synthesize all this into some sort of a, 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 a message. The bottom line is water in California is not a simple issue. Water in California is, in fact, a national issue if you look at the amount of water that is consumed by people in the United States from the food that they consume that's grown in California. So I think that there's a lot of issues. Um, and when we start talking about sustainability in Southern California, with the population on the increase, I think you saw Orange County is something a little over 3 million. I've heard it said that the, the, the developers want to take it up to 4 million. That's exactly what we don't need. But there's money in development, and therefore uh, the, uh, the politicians will follow the money. So at any rate, um, I'm hoping we have a little bit of time for, for discussions, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. <laughs>